Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to come together tonight to worship you and to encourage one another in your word. I ask that you would bless this time. Help us to understand what you have said in your word and just give us wisdom and knowledge from the text of scripture tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. One of the great aspects of the book of Colossians is that it encourages us to think in a biblical way about every single aspect of life. It calls us not only to think biblically about what we might consider to be theological doctrines, but about everything, because ultimately everything becomes theological in the end. We should think biblically about the doctrine of the atonement of Christ, but we should also use scripture as our foundation for evaluating the cultural issues of the day and seek to be biblical and faithful to the text of scripture when examining those things. Understanding Christianity not just as a religion to be lived in your private life and in your head, but as a complete system of thought to be lived out in everything is truly vital for us as we go through our lives. I love what the great defender of the faith, Cornelius Van Til, said. He states, apologetics is the vindication of the Christian philosophy of life against the various forms of the non-Christian philosophy of life. And apologetics, if you're not familiar with that term, is referencing defending the faith. So ultimately, he's saying we're called to defend biblical doctrine in every area against that which would oppose the truth of Christ. And that's what I want you to notice about that quote, is how he's pitting Christian philosophy versus non-Christian philosophy. And it's something that comes into play in every single realm which we would think of. He, he says that we are to defend every area of Christian philosophy if we're to be faithful to the Lord. Well, how much of life does biblical Christianity cover? Van Til says this, he says, the Bible is authoritative on everything of which it speaks. Moreover, it speaks of everything. So if we are truly to live out a deep biblical Christianity, we must live for the glory of our Lord in every single area of life. We must bring the Bible to bear in everything, but how exactly are we to take that action? How do we bring the Bible to bear in everything? What does it look like to live in a way that honors Christ in every sphere of our lives? Well, we begin to scratch the surface of that idea, at least barely scratch the surface of it, by looking at Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7 this evening. And so turn with me there and let's see what the Word of God says about living biblically in every area of life. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And so as we proceed in this passage today, I want you to notice the sharp contrast that we see specifically in Colossians chapter 2 from verse 3 all the way through verse 8. We've talked about this theme about biblical wisdom versus worldly wisdom, but I want you to notice it in these verses. In verse 3, Paul has asserted that all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ, as we saw this morning. In verse 4, he says that he mentioned that so that no one would delude you with plausible arguments. And then and here in verses 6 through 7 this evening, we see the truth that Paul talks about actually walking in the ways of Christ. And in verse 8, he mentions the fact that we should be captive to Christ and not the philosophy of the world. And so ultimately, we might say that Paul is setting forth a Christian world view here in these verses. And I love how Dr. Greg Bonson has described that term worldview. He says this, he says, everybody has what can be called a worldview, a perspective in terms of which they see everything and understand their perceptions and feelings. A worldview is a network of related presuppositions in terms of which every aspect of man's knowledge and awareness is interpreted. So what Dr. Bonson here is clarifying for us is that every single person has a way of seeing the world. That is their world view. They have the foundational commitments which will dictate all of the rest of their beliefs. An atheist has a worldview. A Muslim has a worldview. The Christian has a worldview. Every single person has a worldview. But only Christians have the correct worldview. 
when considering worldviews which oppose Christianity, it's not just that we differ on one or two ideas. Whether we battle on every single front of the war, we are completely at odds. That is the idea that Paul is communicating here in Colossians in chapter 2. We stand completely opposed to the false earthly beliefs because our allegiance is to the Lord. Are there points of agreement between Christianity and other worldviews? Well, of course there are in some senses. An atheist can look at the clock and see what time it is just like a Christian can. The atheist can understand that 2 plus 2 equals 4, but what they cannot do is give a reason why that is actually the case. Because the atheist has to borrow from the Christian worldview in order to believe that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Why is that? Well, if everything is purely physical, then why do we have non-physical things such as mathematical equations and laws of logic? If the atheist worldview is true, we shouldn't have those types of things. So the atheist can see, yeah, 2 plus 2 equals 4, but they can't provide a foundation for that. The reality of Christianity being a worldview is something that we as the church need to get back to understanding. Christ is the Lord over all, as we saw in chapter 1 of Colossians. He has all the wisdom and knowledge for everything that we need, as we saw at the start of chapter 2. This truth means that we stand opposed to ungodly thinking in the realm of medicine, just as we would in the realm of theology, because we are to honor Christ in every area of life. We oppose unbiblical doctrine, whether it relates to politics or the topics of spiritual gifts. We're to hold to the truth either way. We are to be just as committed to educating our children as in the ways of God as we are to making sure the Word of God is faithfully preached on Sunday morning. True biblical Christianity is opposed to the sinful ways of the world at every single turn. We are a marked people called to be ambassadors of Christ, and that fact means that we live in submission to Him and bring our Christian worldview to bear in all that we do. Now, I wanted to set that backdrop and the full picture of the context for our passage here this evening. And we see the word therefore at the start of verse 6. And so as a result of all that we saw this morning in verses 1 through 5 about the truth of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge being in Christ, we are now going to see how we are called to live, to walk in this life as Christians. The implication of the Christian worldview is that it not only changes how we think, but it actually changes how we live every single day. Because once we run to the sufficiency of the knowledge which is in Christ, once we see all the depths of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in him, we understand that wisdom and we see the way that he has actually called us to live in this world. That is why it says, therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And so the question, of course, that immediately jumps off the page is, what does it mean for us to walk in Christ? What a, the particular Greek word here used to reference walking is actually utilized throughout the New Testament in a couple of different ways. First of all, it's used to discuss physical walking, such as when you walked from the door to the pew that you're sitting in. Or it says in Matthew chapter 4, 18, that Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. The word is also used in Matthew eleven five, where it is said that the lame walk, when Christ is telling John the Baptist's disciples what to tell him to encourage him. And so that's an interesting, those are interesting uses of the word. That's one specific use. Another use is found in Mark chapter 7, verse Verse 5. That's a little bit more clarifying for us in our passage today. Mark 7, verse 5 says, And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And so walking in that passage specifically means conducting yourself according to something. In this verse, the Pharisees and the scribes were upset because the disciples weren't living according to the traditions. They weren't living according to those things which had been man-made and set forth. The Apostle Paul also gives a clarifying usage in Romans chapter 8, verse 4, which says this, In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
And so Paul specifically points out that we don't walk according to the flesh. We don't walk according to the ways of the old sinful man any longer as Christians. It's not the goal of our life to indulge sinfulness. We, we don't seek to please ourselves through sin. We seek to put sin to death and walk in Christ. We seek to crucify the flesh. We walk according to the Holy Spirit, as Paul says in this passage. And so when we come back to Colossians in chapter 2, in verse 6, we see where we are told to walk in Christ. And by that, we know that Paul is saying that we need to conduct ourselves according to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we need to follow his ways as we have been commanded in his word. And so instead of following after the world, we follow Christ. To walk in Christ is to follow him every single day. And it is to live fully dedicated to him in all that you do. And so whenever we start to see Paul here talking about a way we are called to live our entire life, that we're called to live for Christ every day, we must ask the question then, how can we walk in Christ in everything? How can we walk in Christ and how we take care of our families? How can we walk in Christ and how we take care of and perform our job duties? How can we walk in Christ as the local church? How can we walk in Christ in every other area of life? And these are questions that we're called to pursue as we grow in the Christian life. They're areas that we will progressively grow in by the grace of God as we mature and grow up in Christ. And if we look at verse 7, we see the answer to how we can walk in Christ. Read it again with me. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And so the first thing that you're going to have to do if you're going to have a robust Christian worldview is that you need to be rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have to have something to go back to time and time again as a measuring stick by which you will determine what is good from what is evil and what is true from what is false. You must have that solid foundation of truth truth, which will never move no matter how turbulent the waves of the society and the culture and the world around you hit against it. The core foundational element of your worldview must be Christ or else you will have a false worldview. And notice how Paul starts off here at the foundational level here in verse 7, that you must be grounded in Jesus and the revelation of his word if you are to walk in Christ. That's what he's setting forth for us. And in Paul's imagery here, it actually echoes back to the very first psalm. Verse 3 of that psalm discusses the righteous man being planted like a tree by streams of water. And of course, this is the element of being grounded in something. And it stands opposed to the ways of the world. That we as Christians, when we talk about being grounded in something, that's a distinctly Christian idea. That's not an idea that the world likes to hold to. According to our culture today, your family can be whatever you want it to be. If you want to marry someone of the same sex, that is fine by the culture. You can change your beliefs on a dime because there is no ultimate truth, so don't worry about being deeply rooted there. You can even change your gender whenever you want to. Don't worry about having to be rooted in the gender that God gave you. Don't worry about being rooted in the idea of a creator. They don't want to be rooted in anything. The world today doesn't want to be rooted in anything. At least that's what they profess. But what they really want is to be rooted in the ways of their sinful flesh. That's why they seek to destroy the reality of what is good as defined by God. The root of their worldview is the satanic world system and their love for sin. They want to destroy marriage between a man and a woman because it was instituted by God. The culture takes aim at absolute truth because you can only have absolute truth if you have the biblical God. The secular society wants to take the children of the day and turn them into the servant of the state tomorrow. They don't want to see parents faithfully raising their children according to the word of God because those children might actually grow up to be good Christians who love the Bible and who will actually live like it. The root of their worldview, the root of loving sin, of loving the lies of the world system, poisons the entire thing. In contrast, we are rooted in Christ. 
because, this, because the culture has the false worldview that poisons everything else, but because we have the true root, the true foundation for a solid worldview, that means that we stand for truth, for goodness, for beauty, and for love. We, we love sound knowledge. We love wisdom because it comes from God. We rejoice in the boundaries that he has set for us and his creation because they are good and righteous. And instead of saying that as a man we want to become woman or as a woman, we want to become men. We rejoice in how God has created us and seek to live faithfully as biblical men and biblical women as those distinct roles as set forth by God. We see children as a blessing from God and marriage is a good institution. We fight for what is good and true in any and every circumstance because we are rooted in Christ who is himself the perfection of truth and the perfection of goodness. And so the first thing that you're going to have to have, and if you're going to possess a solid Christian worldview, if you're going to walk in Christ, is you must be rooted in him. And secondly, and we see it in verse 7, you must be built up in him. And this fact means that there's going to be a stage of growth. And that stage lasts your entire life. That we are continually being built up in Christ. We are learning his word. We are growing in it. We're seeking to put to death the remaining sin in our lives. And we're learning to pursue Christ more and more every single day. And the idea here is that you and I will be built up to a point of maturity. And I want you to notice these two metaphors that Paul is using here in this passage. As we said, the idea of being rooted, it reminds us of a deep tree as depicted in the first psalm. It echoes back to that very first psalm written millennia before the book of Colossians was even penned. And the notion of being built up, it reminds us of what? It reminds us of a house, doesn't it? That's what we think of whenever we hear of something being built up. And of course, that would take us back to Christ's words in Matthew chapter 7. Turn with me there quickly. Matthew seven twenty four through 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And so the first thing that we need to notice here is that the difference between the wise man and the foolish man is not that one built a house and the other didn't. Notice that both of these men build houses. When discussing worldviews, which you will base your life upon, as I said earlier, every single person has one. Whether or not they profess to have it or not is completely irrelevant. They do have one. Everyone has a house. Christ is not saying that the difference between those two men, the wise man and the foolish man, is whether or not they build, but what they build on. Because the wise man builds on Christ, who is the solid rock. And so once again, this metaphor, this idea of being built up, it causes us to think foundationally. But it also causes us to think about growth. The idea here that need is being reiterated is a need to think about everything in your life being built upon Christ. Your physical body is to be used for the glory of the Lord. Your mind must be used in subjection, in submission to Christ so that you're utilizing the power of your brain for his sake. Your imagination is to be submitted to the Lord so that you're using those creative powers for his glory. The very desires of your heart, the very desires of your soul are to be submitted to the Lord and submitted to the word of God so that you're longing and desiring after his righteous ways. What I'm getting at here is that the house, the foundation of your life, everything and all that you are is to be built upon Christ, who is the solid rock. In other words, you don't build 90% of your house on the rock and 10% of your house on the sand of the world. You, you don't think about 90% of life in a Christian biblical way and 10% of life in a worldly way. No, the entirety of your life is to be Christian. The entirety of your life is to be biblical and to be founded on Jesus. That's why I brought up Dr. Van Til's quote at the very beginning of this message where he talks about biblical Christianity, the Bible speaking about everything. 
Christianity is an entire life view, and that necessitates that we understand that Christ is the Lord of our entire life, which means every single second of every single day is to be used for His glory. And here's the other point that we need to draw from the metaphor that Paul uses in, verse, in, in the seventh verse of the second chapter in Colossians. Building not only implies that you have a good foundation, it does imply that, but it also implies that you are exerting effort to actually build the house. Going through the process of constructing a home is a lot of work. And it, even if you use a building contractor, it's still a lot of work. But primarily, the idea of this metaphor would be that you're literally building your own house. That, that would be the metaphor that would fit here. And that's a lot of work if you're going to build your own home. We are to exert effort and energy to grow in Christ. However, we must understand that Colossians chapter 1 Verse 29, Paul says that it is Christ himself who energized him. And so the energy for this growth process, for the sanctification process, it comes from Christ who gives it to us. And so do we work? Yes, we do work. We do seek to grow. But it is the energy of Christ that sustains us. It is his grace that gives us the wisdom and the knowledge that we need to grow. It is his grace that saved us, and it's his grace that sanctifies us. But if you are built on the wrong foundation, you will not grow in the righteous ways of Christ. But because we are built on the solid foundation, we will continue to grow in Him. And as I said, being built up in Christ, it also implies that you actually know how to grow. And that's where the Scripture comes in, that Christ and His Word are the foundation of our lives because it is in the Scripture where the Lord speaks to us. It's in the Bible where we actually learn how to pray, how to follow Christ, how we know what is good and what is evil. It is in the Holy Word of God specifically revealed to us where we know the God of all of creation. So it is the foundation which tells us how we are to build our life. We have all that we need for life and godliness in the Holy Word of God. And the third metaphor here in this passage is that we will be established in the faith, as we see here in verse 7. And this is the result of being deeply rooted, of being built upon the solid foundation, of building upon, according to the rules of Scripture, that you're established, you're stable, you're not being tossed to and fro by every wind of false doctrine. You're not wavering when the going gets tough. When the storms come, you're not going to be moved because you're built solidly upon Christ. When persecution comes, you will not run away. You will not withdraw from the fight because you have stability in the Lord. And so do you want to be steady for uncertain days ahead? Then build your life on Christ. Think biblically about everything and be rooted in the Lord. Praise God that we have the Holy Scripture which tells us how we are to think about everything. We're not left trying to figure it out on our own. We just need to read the Bible and apply it because that's where God has told us about all of these things. And, and notice that, that Paul says, just as you were taught here in verse 7. He reminds them that, hey, you've been previously taught all of this before. You just need to go back and you need to remember this and you need to put it into practice. That Paul's not inventing some type of a new doctrine here. He's not coming up with some type of a new idea. He's pointing them to the truth of God that has already been declared to them. Well, listen, we don't need for some person to come up and to write a, a book about 10 brand new ideas for Christian growth. We just need to be remembering of what we have been taught in God's Word, because it is God's Word that is sufficient. And Paul is pointing them to that fact here as he closes the seventh verse, and he reminds them to abound in thanksgiving, as we see here in this passage. And that's one of the most distinct things about the Christian life is thankfulness. That you must be thankful to God and rejoice in Him. Sinners live in anxiety and worry and all kinds of guilt, but we have been set free as the people of God. We have been set free from sin, and therefore we know true joy in Christ. Because Christ has redeemed us from our sins, He has called us into eternal life and to an everlasting relationship with Himself. And He has now commanded us to go out into the world and to live in light of all of these realities and all of these truths and all of this biblical doctrine. 
He has called us to live in the light of these things in the midst of a dark age. And because we know him, the attitude of our hearts is to be one of thankfulness. The thankfulness and the joy of a Christian, it goes far beyond anything that the world can ever know or can ever imagine. That we, even in the midst of difficult times, in the midst of all kinds of trying situations, can live with hope and with joy. The world cannot understand that. And this thankful heart is the fruit of a mature Christian. It's the fruit of someone who's been deeply rooted in Christ, grounded in the word of God, built up in the Lord Jesus. Their heart overflows in thankfulness for all that God has done. You are thankful for Christ has ransomed you from the ways of sin, and he has shown you, not only has he ransomed you, but he's also shown you in his word the paths of joy and righteousness which you are called to walk in. And so I hope that all of us will see this particular passage as a challenge to build every area of our life upon Christ and his word, who, who, which is the foundation for all of our thinking and all of our living. Let's close in prayer here this evening. Father, thank you for the opportunity to dive into your word tonight. Thank you for the blessing of seeing this passage. I ask that you would help us to honor you in every single area of our lives, that we would build on you, Lord Jesus, and build upon your holy word and trust in its sufficiency as we bring it to bear in every area of life. Help us to bring glory to you over this next week. And it's in your name I pray. Amen.